Welcome back to In The Midst. So today we are continuing with our focus on marriage this month. And today we're talking about what is the big deal about marriage. Maybe you've said this before, you've thought this before. Um, maybe you were in a long-term relationship and people were asking you, when are you going to get married? And you're like, we don't need to get married. It's fine. But I want to go through some biblical principles and show you what the big deal is about marriage, why it's important. Um, I feel like in our current um, day and time, marriage has been reduced to a ring and a piece of paper, and that's not what it is. Um, that is just a sign, a display of marriage. Um, like the wedding, you know, you can get married without the wedding, you can get married without your ring, but it's just a display. So we're gonna talk about what makes marriage so important. Um, if you are 30 and younger, I'm almost 30, if you are 30 and younger, you probably don't even remember a time of when society looked down on people for being divorced, for being pregnant outside of wedlock, um, living together before marriage, for being homosexual. These things are so commonplace today that for my generation and younger, um, you know, us millennials and then everyone after us, it's really hard to imagine being sent off to Aunt Susie's house for a couple months because you were pregnant and you got sent off before you got, you know, to where you were showing, you came back with no baby, you were forced to put it up for adoption, you know, all these things. People look down on you for being a single mom. Um, you know, it really did used to be like that. It was, you were almost an outcast in society. I'm not saying that's okay at all. I'm just saying that's how far we've come um, in our thinking as a society. So, um, it's bizarre really to think that people were treated that way, but I believe we've gone to the other far end of the spectrum of it's okay. Nothing matters. Anything goes, do it makes you happy. And we have to find somewhere in the middle, which is where the Bible is. We don't, you know, shame people like that, but sin is still sin and, you know, shouldn't just be okay, you know? So, um, it's like I said, it's not okay to treat these people as less than just because they, you know, did sin or made a mistake, whatever you want to call it, sin. Um, but like I said, we have to find somewhere in the middle. So it's also looked on as strange if you're married more than 10 years, I feel like, or even five because divorce is so common. And if it doesn't work, it's fine. Um, and marriage isn't held so tightly in such a high regard of, we're going to make this work. And again, I'm not talking about cases of abuse and all that. Um, but there's this thing called a no fault divorce called, um, where you don't have to have a reason to get divorced. It's no one's fault. It just didn't work out. There's, um, terms for that. And people get divorced over some of the craziest reasons. No one gets married saying, you know, eh, if we get divorced, it's not a big deal. When I truly believe that when you get married, you're standing there on your wedding day committing those vows one to another, you really think this is for life, but life happens and suddenly it's not as important. I'm not saying that divorce isn't hard and most people don't just, oh, well, divorce, no big deal. You know, it's not like, you know, take it off the trash, but it's not held like it used to be. And I know a lot of our grandparents, great grandparents stayed married and there was abuse that they just never talked about. So again, I'm not talking about those situations, but Let's start at the beginning of marriage. Where did it come from? Who designed it? Where did this idea come from? Simply, it was God. This is why the culture, the government, society does not have the right to define what marriage is. They didn't create it. God created it. God ordained it. God established it. God said, this is what a marriage model is. Um, one man, one woman. Okay. So, in Genesis... We see that the Lord said, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make it help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not an help meet found for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman 
and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. That's Genesis 2, 18 through 25. This was the first marriage. Why did God create it? There's a few reasons. First of all, I believe for companionship. Adam was surrounded by everything. Eden was perfect. There were animals, but he did not have the companion. So God created that need in him and us for companionship. Verse 18 tells us that it was not good for man to be alone. We were created with the need of companionship. Secondly, God created marriage for intimacy. Physical intimacy, spiritual, emotional are all meant to be enjoyed only within the realm of marriage. We lose so much when we take this outside of the bounds that God has given us. This is a special bond and connection. Intimacy is not dirty. It's not disgraceful. It's not inappropriate when it's where God said it needs to be. Um, it is so precious that God said it's not to just be shared with everyone. It is supposed to be between you and your spouse at marriage, and that is it. We see in scripture that another reason for marriage is that it's the best environment for children to be raised in. Marriage was created by God to bring him glory. Our marriages should be an example of God's love, grace, and forgiveness. Um, your marriage is part of your testimony. This is a big deal, okay? You are closer to your spouse than anyone else. You see their faults, their failures, their struggles. And when you prefer them, you give them grace, you give them forgiveness, you love them through it, you pray for them, that's how God loves you. And you get to demonstrate that to the world and they get to see Christ. Because the world is saying, I'm not putting up with that, I'm leaving. And when we are before God on our knees saying, God, help my marriage, help my husband, help me change our situation, and you stay, everyone else says, whoa, how did you do that? I would have left. There's no way I could have done it. And when we're honest and we say, maybe I wanted to leave, maybe I thought about it, it wasn't easy, but it was the Lord. And if I didn't have God, there's no way we could have gotten through it. And we point everybody back to the Lord through our marriages. Marriage is still important and necessary today. It's not outdated. It's not just, eh. It's very important. Marriage is far from outdated. God puts so much emphasis on marriage and the home in his word. Marriage is the environment that God designed for children to be raised in. This is um, a lot of where we find God's blessing and protection when we're in his will, doing things his way. Not just in marriage, but anything, your parenting, how you handle your job, how you treat one another, you know, being honest with people. Um, this includes marriage. God does not have exceptions to this design. Living together, sleeping together, having children outside of marriage is not his perfect plan. Do these things happen? Yes, because we have a free will, but this is not God's best for us, okay? Marriage was created for us to have the proper place to enjoy all of these things freely. Maybe you have been intimate with someone outside of marriage um, you know, before you were married or there was an affair, anything like that. And most people that you will talk to will say, I wish I wouldn't have done that. It actually did cause me heartache. It was fun in the moment because it's fun. It's enjoyable. Of course, we're created to want that physical touch, um, but it's not special. Okay, and when you save that, doesn't matter how old you are, if you've been divorced, if you are widowed, then wait for that next marriage relationship if God brings that to you. But it doesn't matter how old you are, what phase in life you're in, seeking that outside of marriage is not going to bring God's best for you. Is it hard to wait? Yes. Okay, God created us with that desire, but we have to give that over to him and ask him to help us to keep it within the bounds of marriage, to wait for his best for us. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Um, God is not against sex. He's not. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 through 5, Paul says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, this is why, avoiding fornication. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time 
that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Um, there's a lot here. A lot of people actually want to kind of gloss over this because they're not sure what to do with it. This is not saying um, I have to give my husband intimacy no matter what. Some people actually teach that. Um, this is also in context of everything else God has said about marriage in the home. Love each other, prefer one another, okay? Treat your wife as the weaker vessel. Um, love her as Christ, love the church. That's not forcing her. That's being understanding, being patient. If she says no, then that's okay. Um, I'm not, and the husband, the wife, the same way. You know, if he's tired, he's been sick, he's, you know, worked a bunch of overtime this week, and he says, honey, not tonight, and you get mad, you get, you know, upset and you try to talk him into it because it can go both ways. No one wants to talk about the wife being this way. Um, that's not okay. That's not preferring with another. That's not being understanding. That's not being loving. Okay. This is saying that you should be saying yes more than you're saying no. Okay. Um, this whole intimacy is only for procreation and once a month to keep him happy and whatever. That's not God's design. The only time I can find that God says not to do that is right here. And he says, except it be with consent for a time. You both have agreed that this is going to happen for a time to give yourselves to prayer and fasting. But God says, come together again because Satan is going to tempt you. Satan knows when that's not going on. And he's going to bring that temptation in, whether it's another person, whether it's something on the internet. And God doesn't want that to happen. Okay. I'm not excusing those things at all, but God clearly said, Hey, watch out for this temptation. Do not put yourselves in this place. God doesn't want that to happen. He doesn't want your marriage to be destroyed because of intimacy issues, okay? Proverbs 5, 18 through 21, Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breasts satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. Why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. It's talking to the man, but that applies to us women too. Don't be seeking attention from another man. Um, 1 Corinthians six eighteen: Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own bodies. God says this is a big deal, okay? Are all marriages the same? No, they're not. Um, if you have been on my Instagram at all, you know that there's things that I've shared that I do for my husband that I've tried to use to encourage other wives to do. Um, and I was burned at the stake because not all marriages are the same. Um, some things that I do, you guys have said I was nuts. There's no way you would do it. And okay, you know, if that works for you, fine. Don't be so against trying something new or going out of your way for your husband. Um, but not all marriages are the same. But they all have the same basic principles from the Bible that they are to be built upon. We all have different preferences, thoughts, convictions, personalities. My husband might do something that would drive another woman absolutely crazy, but it doesn't bother me. We're all different. Um, the simple truth is often the reason people get divorced is because we're different. There's a legal term called irreconcilable differences, like I mentioned in the beginning. When you have God in the midst of your marriage, he works these things out. Um, I don't understand it all myself, and I've been married now for almost 14 years this week, and there's still some things that my husband did that bothered me, or I would do that bother him, and sometimes I catch myself doing those little things, like looking at my phone when he's talking to me, and he doesn't get upset about it anymore. Um, normally, he would stop what he was saying. He's like, can you put your phone down? Um, he doesn't say that as much anymore. I don't do it as much, but I catch myself and go, okay, I need to put this down, before he even says it. So he doesn't react as quickly to that anymore. God's helped him to have grace with me. Okay, that's the only reason, the only thought that I can have. God just softens and changes our hearts a little at a time if you let him. He will show you the good in your spouse. It's there. You just have to look for it. And sometimes we have to pray and ask God to help us see it because we struggle to find it, okay? There are seasons in marriage. There are things that your spouse is going to do that's going to drive you nuts. And you're like, okay, we're not even on the same page here. Um, God wants to help you. Just ask him, okay? Um, if you, let me see here. If you begin to implement this one verse in your marriage, things are going to change. Let this be the beginning of a solid foundation, this is the love and respect verse, Ephesians 5, 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, 
and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Reverence is a deep respect and appreciation. So what about divorce? What do we do with that? Where does that fit? Um, I've never experienced divorce, neither has my husband personally. Um, my parents are still married, his are not. Um, so he has seen his mom get divorced and married and divorced. So he's been the child in the home seeing that happen, but that's the closest that we have. Um, we've had close friends get divorced. I was helped my best friend through a divorce. So that's as close as we've been. We haven't experienced this differently. So I'm, I don't want to sound or speak like an expert because I haven't been there. I don't know, but I know divorce happens even within the church. Satan wants to get into your marriage and cause trouble and division. God created marriage because it's beautiful and it brings him glory. So this is the very reason that Satan, this is the very reason that Satan hates it and wants to destroy it. Um, some people have said, if we don't get married, we can't get divorced. Okay, like I guess, but it doesn't actually solve any problems. So it's really not a solution. This is simply Satan's counterfeit. If God said marriage is holy, honorable, enjoyable, beautiful, the right environment for raising children, proper place for intimacy, etc., and he did, then you can bet Satan is going to foil that the best he can as quick as he can. So why is this? Because living outside of God's will is sin. Just like in Genesis chapter 3, when Satan caused Eve to sin, Satan um, wanted to mess up God's plan. He didn't want her living in God's will. He wants the same for us. So Satan can attack your husband, your children, all that stuff, and destroy the family, then it causes, especially if you're a Christian, you are a target, okay? If I could just get everyone to realize that. Satan wants to destroy you. You are not off his radar. You are not immune to his attacks, especially if you're a Christian. That way the world and other Christians can look at that and say, maybe God's way doesn't work. If they can't make it, can we? Like, maybe God doesn't know what he's doing. And it gets you to question God, just like Eve did. So just be aware of this. Satan does not like anything that reminds him of God, including you and your marriage. Satan is a liar, okay? Do not give him an open door. Jesus said, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I am come that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. John 10, 10, the thief here is Satan. God has given us plenty of warnings about Satan and his plans. He's given us warnings. He's told us how to prepare for Satan's tactics. We just have to pay attention. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 10, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, your, this is personal, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Um, Matthew 19, 3 through 6. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them in the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. You made your vows not only to one another, but to the Lord. Whether you believe it or not, life is a spiritual battle. C.S. Lewis once said, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Let that sink in. It's claimed by God, but counterclaimed from Satan. He's always trying to get back some ground to make God look bad, to get one of God's children on the sidelines not serving him anymore. I pray that you will see the value in your marriage, regardless of what society says, no matter where you are, no matter what you've done. You can begin to make changes today. We just have to pray and ask God for his help. We can't do this alone, okay? Um, turn to the Lord. Follow the blueprint he's given us, and you will not regret it. Trust him today. Stay in the Word. Stay close to the shepherd and let him lead you in paths of righteousness.